So Lutea Voyas Asini, you have searched far and wide in your quest for truth and knowledge. And now, your journey has led you here. Welcome to the Assassin's Den. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Assassin's Den podcast. I am your host, Loomer, as always, and today we have a very special guest. Uh, the Assassin's Creed fans know him, of course, for his composition of the soundtracks to Assassin's Creed 1, Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, and then parts of Revelations as well. We have the one and only Jesper Kidd here with us today. Jesper, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so as most of you know, the Ezio collection was just released on PS4 and Xbox One, all three of Ezio's games, and along with it, the new Assassin's Creed Best of Jesper Kid album features remastered tracks from all four of the games, as well as some unreleased and extended versions of some tracks. Um, you can pick up the album digitally right now, and very soon it will be out on a very cool uh, picture disc LP. Uh, it's really beautiful. And we're going to have like a very special giveaway uh, around this uh, picture disc LP near the end of the podcast. So please stay tuned and we'll tell you how you can get in on the giveaway for that. So I thought, uh, you know, the best way to, to go about such a broad body of work, definitely the most Assassin's Creed music that any composer has put together. So any single composer has done so far. Um, it's to kind of go chronologically, kind of step through certain questions about the albums for AC1 through Revelations, and then we'll get to some of these general questions uh, that are more about either composition or what's next and other things like that. So uh, why don't we start right off with uh, Assassin's Creed 1, and our first question here is from Giant Tabby, who simply asks, how did you first become the composer for the original Assassin's Creed? Yeah, um, Patrice was, uh, well, is a fan of my Hitman music, and that's where he, um, that's something he mentioned to me uh, later. Um, and based on that, I was asked to um, to demo for Assassin's Creed 1 together with a bunch of other composers. Um, so I wrote a demo, and um, the team ended up liking my demo and wanted to hire me for the game. Um, and then the first thing I did for the game was the uh, E3 trailer for Assassin's Creed 1. Um, mm. So that was before I actually started any of the music. And at, at E3, I, um, I met with, with Patrice and uh, Jade Raymond, and they invited me to a hotel room where they showed me on their laptop some concept art and ideas about the game. I couldn't believe what they were trying to achieve. It, it was amazing. Yeah. I, I didn't actually see any footage from the game, but they were you know, showing me these drawings and stuff, and this is what the game is going to be able to you know, do, and the fact that you could, you know, walk around a city and, and anything you saw in the city you could crawl and you could go, you know, you could go to, that, I had never heard about that before. That was, that was amazing, you know? Yeah. So is this, sorry, is this the, the E3 where the original Assassin's Creed trailer debuted that you had scored? Yeah, the first one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. So it's like you, you scored like this whole trailer, which kind of gives you an idea of a lot of the basic concepts of the game. And then, but then they're also just showing you, okay, here's the concept art for like the real game, and we can start on the real soundtrack now, more or less. Yeah, I mean, after E3, you know, um, uh, you know, then I went to to visit the team in Montreal, um, and mm -hmm. they showed me the game and you know how far they've gotten and stuff. And it was just uh, I'd never seen anything like it. You know, uh, it, I was completely blown away i couldn't believe what they were set out to what they were trying to achieve and i couldn't believe they pulled it off i mean this was just such a groundbreaking project i'd done quite a few games up until that point and this was some of, some of the most groundbreaking work I, I had seen yeah it was definitely one of those games where it was, it was one of the first games i remember i had seen where i was like this could not have been done on the previous generation of consoles like this is truly a next gen <clears throat> Game with the you know that's that's it exactly that's exactly how I felt too. I felt this is truly a next generation game when it came out, and it's 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 interesting because it's one of those games when you look back, there's only a few of those games like Grand Theft Auto 3 when they suddenly switched from 2D to 3D, you were like whoa you know something just happened here, and we just you know went a whole step up, you know and I felt the same thing happened with uh, Assassin's Creed 1, so I was obviously very excited to be to be part of that. 
Um, so what I'd like to do for each of these uh, blocks of games that we talk about is we got a lot of questions about specific tracks, and I think it would be kind of interesting to do almost kind of like a deep dive a little bit on specific tracks from each album, usually ones that kind of stick out in the minds of fans a lot. And I was, sure. uh, we had a question here from the Rated D who asks, um, how did City of Jerusalem from AC1 come together? What inspired that specific piece? And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, City of Jerusalem, and then also if if it applies, uh, Flight of Flight Through Jerusalem as well, since those tracks kind of flow together in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, I mean, in order to talk about those tracks, I have to talk a little bit about Assassin's Creed 1 and what we were trying to achieve with the music. Um, you know, there were there was these different cities, Acre, Damascus, and Jerusalem, and um, where we were trying to achieve a different mood for each city. And so Acre was more Christian-inspired. You know, Damascus was like, you know, Islam, Muslim, you know, this whole world. And then Jerusalem was a melting pot of those two religions. Um, so the music for Jerusalem had to feel like it carried a spiritual, you know, something visually spiritual that you could, that you could really feel when you heard it. Um, and so that was one of the main um, uh, ideas behind the, the city of Jerusalem track, to, to really get to depth of the spirituality that people felt back then. I think it's something that, of course, there's still lots of spiritual people today, but spirituality back then, I just think it was more on the surface, you know, it was, it was more widespread. And so it was very important, I think, to, to get that out. And also when I started working on the score, you know, Patrice was very specific that the team was looking for three elements in the music. They wanted it to, you know, embody uh, war. There was a lot of war going on, you know, in mm -hmm. 1191. And then also the third crusade was very tragic, you know, a lot of people were murdered. And so they wanted the tragic element in there. And finally, mysticism, which I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Of course, the other elements are interesting too, but I found that the more I started working with mysticism, the more unique the, the score became. And I felt the team understood that too. Uh, so I ended up focusing on mysticism more so. Um, but you know, all three elements are in there. Okay, so mysticism is kind of took the lead more on the Jerusalem tracks, you would say? Yeah, you know, mysticism, uh, you know, is, is, isn't everything. It embodies the whole soundtrack. But I think spirituality is what I was most inspired by for the, you know, city of Jerusalem to really get that feel out that, you know, people here are very spiritual, you know. And as far as like the other um, track, Flight Through Jerusalem, um, I always looked at the horse riding sequences more as like flying sequences. That was just something, hmm. as, as soon as I saw that, that's just where my where, where my thoughts went. So I wanted the music to feel like more like flying, and I thought that was kind of cool too, because it it gave you something a little bit beyond of what you were doing. And I think that's yeah. that's often something I try to go for. If the music, you know, if you go into a dark cave and the music sounds like you're in a dark cave, you know, that's great. But if you can do dark cave <laughs> music and you can make it sound like there's a background story that you are also tapping into then I think everything becomes more cinematic because you're paying attention to the story, you know, and you're paying attention to more so than just what you're doing at that moment. And I think that's something that makes games so interesting, you know, because when you do like film and TV, you're often focusing so much on story, but with games you can, you can go a little bit beyond, you can, you can start adding some stuff that you might not see, you know, at the moment, but it's still there to remind you of elements in the story. Um, you know, I, I feel like when I think about the AC1 soundtrack, or just AC1 in ger general, it's 
it feels like a very, a very cold, well, especially compared to AC2, it feels like a very almost kind of cold and sterile type of game, not just in the um, modern day, but also in the past a little bit. Um, but City of Jerusalem and Flight Through Jerusalem just um, really stick out to me on, on the soundtrack as being uh, like significantly warmer and just more uh, beautiful, I would say, um, as, as kind of like a unique uh, point on the album. Yeah, I mean, spirituality is a, is a beautiful thing, you know? I mean, I think spirituality goes a lot beyond just religion, you know? Yeah. Religion, you're talking about which religion do you actually believe in? With spirituality, you're, you're transcending all that. It's, it's, there's more that we all have in common when it comes to spirituality than which religion we decide to choose, you know? Um, and so if we go to the other end of the spectrum, our, our other question about a specific song from the soundtrack comes from Balkan Swine, who wants to know, I'd very much like to know a thing or two about making of uh, Access the Animus, the AC1 Escape theme, and how long it, did it take to compose it? Uh, Access the Animus, wow, that took a long time to compose that one. Um, <laughs> I should say first, though, that Access the Animus on the album is... Um, it's come from uh, it's it's compiled of three different tracks you know it's got mm. escape low escape high and escape stealth music all yeah. combined together and so all those different cues were written for um you know the transition not the transition the escape sequence you know yeah. um and so the one i'm talking about right now that took a really long time is the last part escape high um the last three minutes of that track was really um you know, it took a while to make. And it, it was because we tried we tried a lot of different things. We wanted a purely orchestral version, a purely electronic version, you know, a version that mixed both together. And, you know, we ended up settling with a version that had some beats on it with some electronics and also like a big theme on it with more orchestral elements. So it was like a mashup of everything in the end. And yeah, that was, uh, that was a tricky one. And it's also the escape sequence, you know, it's very, very important sequence for Patrice when, when we were working on this. Um, he he looks at the he looked at the escape sequence as the moment where the animus was pushed to the limit. You know, you're almost borderline breaking the animus. You know, and you can see that when you play the games. You know, that there's like yeah. little distortion going on, little kind of flicker yeah. stuff. Yeah, there's like DNA. Yeah, exactly. You know. We really wanted to, to, you know, have the sci-fi element come out and, and it needed to feel like we were in the Animus doing those escape sequences because the Animus was taking over at that point. It was, it was being pushed to the limit. It, okay, yeah. taking over might be the wrong word, but, it, but the Animus was becoming more apparent. You know, it was becoming more apparent that we were in a simulation. You were pushing the simulation to the max. Yeah, you were straining it, yeah. Yeah, that was the reasoning behind trying and going for a much more electronic track there. Um, and, you know, they worked so much on that escape sequence in general. The gameplay, it was so fine-tuned and so tweaked. Um, I think it was really fun in the end when you were running and the escape sequences. It was great fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you have an estimate on how long it took to compose it? Um, well, it wasn't all done at the same time. We would do some experiment and I would continue working on the score. Then after okay. they had tested them out, you know, that takes a little while to get feedback from team, from team members and stuff. It would come back and we would try something different, you know. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it took like four or six weeks, but that means I went back and forth a lot on other music for Assassin's Creed 1, you know, as well. Right, right. Okay. Uh, there was a second part to this question, too, uh, regarding the Brotherhood Escapes, which, is, of course, is the um, AC Brotherhood Escape theme. We'll dive into that more later, but um, Balkan Swine was wondering, which escape theme do you consider better, Access the Animus or the Brotherhood Escapes? Well, um, I mean, I, I like Access the Animus. It's one of my, you know, um, it, you know, I definitely like that track. It, it, it has something really, uh, you know, knowing how much work we put into it and how it turned out and how it works. I feel pretty well with the, you know, pretty great with the escape sequence. I was really mm -hmm. proud of that. Um, when we were doing the other, you know, Brotherhood um, the escape track, it was, you know, much more like, you know, written for something that I knew how it, how it was going to work, you know. It wasn't something that kept, you know, tr changing and being tweaked and stuff. So just based on the whole experience with the team, 
I would have to say, you know, Axis the Animus, my favorite. Okay, great. Yeah, it's absolutely one of my favorite tracks um, across all the games, honestly. It's just it's, really... It's so strange because that, you know, sometimes I feel like it's like a guilty pleasure, you know, like in that track, because <laughs> I'm like, this track stands out so much compared to all my other AC music, you know, but it, it's, it's like, it has a really special place in my heart, you know. Yeah. I, I really stands, like that track. Yeah, and it stands out not just in its, um, like, composition but also just like in its structure on as a track on an album because like later tr uh, albums would break out like oh this is Venice Combat Low, this is yeah. Venice Combat High or whatever but this one it's it's just like this I don't know it's like seven or eight minutes I think and it's it's, it's an more than eight minutes yeah it. it's, it's yeah, almost nine like minutes said, I think yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again I put those you know it, it, those three tracks together and it just became this this massive thing you know where it just keeps <laughs> building and building and building and at the end, you're like, whoa, what the hell? You know, you can kind of just feel it, you know, because it just keeps going. Yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. like, all, there's, a, there's, there's always like a little bit of um, tension, like in the music. And whenever I listen to it, I'm waiting for it to finally break out, like at the end, when all of the electronic and all the, the strings and <laughs> everything's just starting to go crazy. But there's so much build up to that that I'm always just yeah. like on edge wanting to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love so listening good to, to it. I guess it's a good hiking track or something. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you're going downhill, you know? from AC1 next is uh, AC2 where I think I don't know I, I think general consensus is that everybody including you really were just firing on all cylinders and improved in on AC1 in pretty much every respect and I know that for me and a lot of other fans the AC2 soundtrack is just generally I think the favorite soundtrack of AC fans and it's just we hold it very dear to our hearts Thank you. And, cool. Yeah. And we have a question here from Mike Hatsuki, who is wondering, how hard was it to transition from the Third Crusade to the Italian Renaissance? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the transition between those two games, um, you know, Assassin's Creed, we worked a lot on all this new gameplay that we, you know, I hadn't seen this before, um, like the escape sequences across the rooftops. And, you know, there was a lot of like investigation music investigation opening music where you were like eavesdropping and you were sitting on benches and then you would get up there was music for when you were following people you know assassin's creed one had uh, like uh, some different gameplay elements um and so i think with assassin's creed 2 there was these games some of these gameplay elements didn't cross over they were you know and and other new elements like flying and stuff were introduced in assassin's creed 2 so i it was pretty apparent from the beginning of starting on ac2 that it was going to be a different score because the game was going to be different. You know, it was kind of like we started over basically is the best way I could put it, you know? And, um, you know, the, the music styles, you know, I, I don't look at it like, is it, is it like difficult or a challenge? I, I'm like, it, yes, of course it's a challenge, but that's why it was fun. You know, it was a completely different music style. Um, so that's really what, um, what was so much fun to, to work on, to having to come up with all this stuff again. Um, you know, and I, of course, did a lot of research on, uh, you know, the instruments and all these things. And, you know, even though it felt more like a, a game that had a very rich, you know, location and time setting, Ubisoft didn't want a purely historical um, score. They wanted something that felt more like, that people could listen to today without being fans of Renaissance music, you know? We, and I, I actually totally agree with this, that I think if you're, you know, how many people are really fans of Renaissance music, you know? We wanted the gamers to, we wanted all the people to like the music. We didn't just want specific, you know, um, elements of a certain group to like it because this was their favorite music. We wanted, you know, we wanted to go broader, you know? 
Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you, you do a little bit of research like on the instruments used in that time period. I guess I, I've always been kind of curious. You know, a lot of the development team, when they're making these AC games, will go and visit the locations and everything. Do you do any of that, or is it kind of purely just um, like on the internet research base? Well, I've been to Italy before, you know. I've never been to um, Florence or, or Venice, but I've been to southern Italy before, Calabria and these kind of areas, you know. So, But I don't know if that was necessarily necessary. I mean, I did research on the music style, uh, of course, and, and I, you know, I'd never done any renaissance music before um, i didn't never really done any music for the 1191 time period you know for Assassin's mm. creed one like and and so i i didn't even know what renaissance music was supposed to sound like you know um, um and that's you know those are some of my favorite projects when i'm asked to come in and give my interpretation of what that could sound like so it was a lot of fun learning about the renaissance and of course there's a lot of renaissance influence on the music you know but yeah. it's all you know done you know in a, in a in a way that we're looking through the animus you know that was mm -hmm. another thing i talked a lot to the team about that this needed to feel like let's remind people that we're in the animus you know and, yeah. and so all the acoustic recordings and orchestral performances and choir we recorded all that kind of stuff solo vocals and you know I ran a lot of it through different equipment and you know filters and you know machines and effects and all that kind of stuff to you know chopped it up and reversed it and did a ton of stuff to it to make it sound like okay we're inside some kind of world where we're obviously not in the current time period but you know we're back in the, the renaissance but something is off it's something a little bit off here and I think that comes out in, in the score. That's, that's what I work to, to bring out, you know? Well, we can't really talk about the Assassin's Creed 2 soundtrack without discussing um, Ezio's Family, which is pr quite possibly, I think, the most popular track out of the entire series. And so I was wondering, uh, you know, in the spirit of these deep dives, if you have any, um, you know, specific memories of composing that track or anything else that you want to share about it. In order to talk about that, I mean, I would need to talk about Earth first, you know. Oh, sure. Because Earth, Earth came first. Okay. That was the experiment. Um, and it was an experiment I did um, before I had um, seen anything from Assassin's Creed 2. You know, I just had the background story. I knew what was going to be the overarching storyline. And I was just struck by this, this whole, um, you know, this thing of, of Ezio losing his his father and his brother, it just felt really, it felt really brutal and, and it felt like, wow, if that doesn't change you, <laughs> I don't know what will, you know? Um, so I felt that was important in the storyline, that it needs its own, its own theme, you know? Um, so I wasn't actually asked to come up with that theme. Um, it was just something that I felt uh, after, you know, researching the game. Um, and so I played it for the team when I came up, when I went up there. And I was like, yeah, I have this track, you should listen to it maybe. All right. <laughs> and so they, they heard that track immediately, you know, Earth, they resonated with, with Earth immediately. And so I was like, okay, this is great. So um, a bit later, as we're working on the score, you know, I, I find out the team has started calling it, calling it like Ezio's track, you know. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I didn't even know we were using that track because there's nowhere to put it. It wasn't written for anything, <laughs> you know, specific. Oh no no, it's it's totally, you know, totally feels like Assassin's Creed 2 and stuff, you know. Um, and so I decided, okay, well, you know, I've been working on the score, and the music style has, you know, evolved a little bit since I I did that track because now I've seen the game and I played the game, so I wanted to do another version of it that felt, you know, like it would embody where the score was heading and it was really honing in on that moment when Ezio lost his family, uh, part of his family. But uh, yeah, so that, that's where that came from. And the interesting thing is I was a little bit nervous because I was like, oh, you know, I'm writing another track that has no place to, we have no place to put it, you know, it wasn't <laughs> written for anything. Um, but when I wrote that track, they were very supportive of it. And so we went and recorded with an orchestra and choir um, and, and soloist. And I was just thinking also, 
a little bit before, you know, we were recording, like, wow, we're putting so much recording time and orchestra time into something that, you know, we don't know if we're even going to use it, you know, but <laughs> the fact that people were so supportive over at Ubisoft about this track is, is what, what kept going. Um, and then when the track was finally done and we had all the live performances and we put everything together, they, they really liked it, you know, they put it in the beginning of the game and they put it at the end of the game. Yep. So it, it worked out, you know. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. you know, it, when it, it ends up in the game uh, as the title reveal, which the title reveals always feel kind of special a little bit in the Assassin's Creed games. And I think this one fit perfectly. Yeah. And I'm really glad they got it in the game, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah me too. it's just a I, really, really beautiful track. I know, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, uh, the soloist vocals, because that's obviously a, a very big part of what makes the track so memorable about like um who the soloist was and anything about uh, that. yeah i mean that was melissa kaplan who also um who i worked with on vocals for assassin's creed one and assassin's creed brotherhood mm. and assassin's creed revelations <laughs> so she's been through all four assassin's creed games with me um and you know i i know her pretty well i've worked with her for for a while so when i write vocals like this i write it for her voice because i know how she's going to sound you know so um, that, that's who she is, and she did a great job on that. Amazing. So uh, we actually have a question somewhat related to Ezio's family from J.B. Linz, who says, uh, well, let me back up and give a little background first. Um, starting in 2014, um, Ubisoft started incorporating et the melody of Ezio's family into a lot of their subsequent games. So that includes Assassin's Creed Unity, Assassin's Creed Rogue, uh, the Chronicles games, and Syndicate where they said that they were use, now using Ezio's family to represent uh, the Assassin's Brotherhood. And so J.B. Linz was wondering, what is your opinion on the fact that some of the later games and possibly the movie are using bits of Ezio's family? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's fantastic that fans have embraced this track so much. You know, it, it's just so awesome. Um, and also, of course, that Ubisoft has embraced it. Um, and, you know, at first I was like, wait, this is Ezio's, you know, theme. But it, as I saw how they started using it, it's like it's, it's transcending Ezio's story, you know? And the track has now gone beyond its original purpose. And, you, you know, I guess you could say it's become something bigger, you know? Yeah. And for me, it, 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 when I see and, and hear this music um, in, in newer projects, I think it's, it's almost like it's the theme, like you said, for the brotherhood. But to me, it represents more like the, the, the pain of of the sacrifice of an assassin, you know, the loss mm. of an assassin. You know, people don't just, you know, like look at Ezio, you know, he lost his father and his brother and that made him step into the shoes of being an assassin. You know, yeah. something happens like that and you change. And so this music, you know, can represent change, but it for me definitely represents the sacrifice of the assassins, you know. Oh, it's, very interesting. So, that, that's how I see it. Yeah, I know I know some of the fans are a little split on this. Some people are like, you know, it, like you said, it is very closely tied to Ezio. It's basically Ezio's theme, more or less. And it's also kind of a very personal 
um, thing that happens to Ezio. Uh, but at the same time, it's like if you're going to choose one melody to represent, um, like to echo through the franchise, you might as well choose the best one as well. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. but... Well, it's also, it's also a, I, I just want to say it's also a theme that lends itself well to having, you know, different re, um, uh, how do you say? I forget the word, but different repurposes. You can repur you can yeah. remix the track in so many different ways, you know, and that and it's just so funny and, and it's so cool to see all these different versions, you know, when you go on YouTube or something and people are playing the track on all these different instruments that I was never supposed to be played on, and it's like wow, this, <laughs> this, you know, and uh, it. So I think again, you know, it has also something to do with the with, with the, it's the type of theme that you can can do a lot of rearranging around it, you know, and you can keep it going, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's very versatile. And I actually remember, because initially I was kind of like, hmm, I don't know how I feel about this, but then I played Assassin's Creed Unity, and I remember the exact point where it really clicked with me, and I had just done one of the major assassination targets against Leroy de Thun in, mm. like, the sewers, and as I was, like, walking, aw as I was kind of half walking, running out of the sewers, like, leaving my target dead behind, like, the track was playing and it used Ezio, the melody of Ezio's family, just like just very low in the track. And then it was mixed on top and it was just really beautiful. And it struck me. It felt like, um, it, you know, to me, I hadn't really thought about it as um, kind of the sacrifice of assassins as before. In that moment, it more hit me about how history kind of echoes, uh, you know, throughout uh, generations and years and it's like what has happened before will like keep happening almost in a way and it, it was really I was surprisingly affected yeah and it's I mean when you look at where it was originally written what it was originally written for you know the ex yeah. the, the hanging scene is what I had in mind you know and the loss of, oh. of your, your okay. close family you know how it is it's just unbelievable really the way he still lost his, his parts of his family in front of his own eyes you know, yeah. but that's not where it was used in the game. You know, used it, it was used for the opening and for the end. So already there, it's starting to show like, okay, you know, it goes beyond just the purpose it was written for because it, it's almost like it tells a bigger story than just that one moment that I had in mind. You know, it, it felt like a, a bigger story when you listen to that. You know, I guess you could say it was more, you know, it yeah. almost has some kind of epic thing that, that transcends all these moments into one track you know and yeah. it's it's kind of like i mean that was you know i, I wish i would have been you know i, I would have known when i wrote it oh yeah we need you know a track that embodies everything that Ezio went through in his whole life let's create one track that sums it all up there it is you know and that's not really yeah, you, know, you can't predict that. You, can, you, you can't plan that out. It's a, right, right. a little ambitious, you know. But that's kind of what I feel. It's it's becoming something that kind of embodies something more than just what it was written for. Yeah, I think it's very well said. All right, well, if we move on uh, for a couple other tracks from Assassin's Creed 2 before we wrap this up. Um, we have a question from Chris um, Kaish, who asks, uh, what inspired the track Dream of Venice? Well, Dream of Venice... Yeah, I mean, you know, Venice is such a mysterious, magical place that I wanted to capture that in the AC music for Venice. And um, I also really felt like, you know, the operatic um, element to come out in the score was important. You know, during the research, I, f I found out that um, during the Renaissance and, do, you know, especially during the, the time of Ezio, operatic, you know, um, operas were more comedic opera. You know, so that we don't have a lot of that today. Um, so I did have yeah. to kind of break the rules a little bit because, you know, these more serious <laughs> operas, they came yeah. later. Um, but I, I felt it was, it was a moment to really, you know, bring out the beauty. And also, Assassin's Creed 2 is a very romantic game, I think. You know, that was one of the things that blew me away the most when I saw it. How everything felt so moody and atmospheric. And, and just beautiful and romantic. I mean, I can't remember the last time I played a romantic game, you know, outside of these, um, of these games. So Ubisoft was yeah. onto something. I wanted to really capture that.
Okay, great. And then uh, before we wrap up AC2, I was wondering, another fan favorite track, one that I absolutely love, is uh, Venice Rooftops, uh, which was also popular enough for you to remix for Soul yeah. Calibur V uh, yeah. as Ezio's kind of uh, stage and theme song. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about that. Any memories or thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, as Ezio's um, track, uh, you know, was becoming popular with the team, for lack of a better word, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I felt okay, you know. Let's get um, let's get this theme put into some of the action music as well, you know. And I think, you know, after Earth resonated so much with the team, I, I felt like they gave me, you know, pretty much full creative freedom and let me loose to come up with something, you know, really creative and, and let me do my thing, you know. And, and that's one of those things that happens, those things you hope would happen on every project, you know. But I think because Earth resonated so strongly with the team, um, they really felt, okay, I, I have plucked into the Animus, let's just set them loose. So that was just another idea of thinking, okay, what can we, uh, what can we do with the team? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I was in the moment of, the, of all this music and it was just riding away and that was another track that I wanted to write. Also, probably a good example of what you were saying earlier about taking like vocals, for example, but then um, kind of electronically altering them a little bit um, to kind of uh, keep the animus slash present involved in the soundtrack as well. Yeah, you know, and I thought it was really cool that if you had this theme that when you were running across the rooftops, that would kind of lift you up, you know, like yeah. an operatic action track, which was romantic and fun and. You know, and, and that's, you know, how I felt this, this, this music ended up, you know, there was a certain romantic side to, to Venice Rooftops as well. All right, well, let's move on to Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Um, and our first question for that is from Inspire HD, who says, I'm currently really enjoying playing ACB, and the soundtrack is one of the main reasons, as I find it helped create a much darker atmosphere. What inspired you to create this shift in tone to a darker one, coming from an otherwise rather similar previous title, plot-wise? Well, I would say that it's, it's you know, not as, you know, it, it is darker, you know? I don't think it's that similar, but but yes, the continuation of the story from AC2 goes into Brotherhood, for sure. Um, but Brotherhood did feel different to me in a sense that the Borgia family was a, was a big part of the story in this game. And, you know, researching the Borgia family, it, it's just become apparent pretty pretty quickly that this score is going to take a dark turn. You know, it's going to become darker, for sure. And you are also in the... You know, Rome in the game is occupied when you start the game, you know. You play to set the, the, the city free. And so there's all this occupation music, you know. And then once you set the, uh, the city free, this music changes into a more kind of beautiful Assassin's Creed II type, um, type music, you know. So, yeah. it, it, you know, I felt... You know, I'm I'm following the story and I'm following the development, and um, you know, following the narratives. That's that's what we do as composers. You know, story is everything, and that's that's where Assassin's Creed Two went. Uh, Brotherhood went. You know. Yeah, I think Brotherhood definitely has one of the most one of the nastiest villains of the series in Cesare Borgia, yeah. and I kind of yeah. mean that like in a good way because it was just so such a delight <laughs> to yeah. interact with. And yeah, and there's another. Defi- no, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying like there's some very menacing tracks on Brotherhood that I think fit yeah, yeah. really well. I was going to say that um, there's actually another thing as well that I had in mind when, when writing this score, and that's the fact that he is now a master assassin. 
you know, so I really wanted that represented as well by like aggressive instruments and performances. Um, you know, he, he, he is a badass, you know, and I think that needs to, <laughs> yeah. you know, that needs to come out through the music that he is more confident in what he does. And he, he, he's yeah. just a really good, you know, assassin now. So that, that yeah. also has to do with the instrumentation, you know. Yeah, like he's he's all grown up. Playtime's over, and he, like you said, more confident uh, in the music and in in the assassin. That's that's really great. Yeah. So speaking of Rome earlier, we have a question from Kyle Sedillo. Um, sorry, Sedillo, who asks uh, for echoes of the Roman ruins. Did you have the yeah. vision of the Italian countryside in mind, or was it more of an on the spot process? Well, um, yeah, I did have an idea of the Italian countryside more specifically. It was um, Italian countryside filled with ruins that that uh, piece was written for. Um, yeah. So I worked on embodying um, music that sounded like it had a past, that sounded like there's a story and there's a history being told here, and there's, you know, there's a lot more to what you're hearing in this area than what you see now. You know, the past is where mm -hmm. this place really came alive. Um, so, so that's what I'm hoping, you know, that it captures. And then finally, we have a question from Jesse Dillon, who asks, and this is coming back to the skate music, but um, first of all, your work uh, is amazing. And then how did you come up with the Brotherhood Escapes? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to hear you like it. Um, Brotherhood Escape was, um, let me think here. It was born from the idea um, that I really like the chase music I wrote for the Assassin's Creed 2 E3 trailer. You know, and uh, the one that takes place in Venice. I guess, yes, right? where he and uh, towards the end, he's running across rooftops. Yep. You know, yeah, and yeah. so that music was was interesting to me, and I was thinking, how can we put this type of feeling in the game? Um, so that's what I did. I went back and 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 started over and said, okay, I'm going to write something that uh, is more in that kind of um, that has more kind of that feeling, and so that's where I started with with the Brotherhood. Okay. You know, I just on a side note that it, um, AC2 cinematic E3 trailer is, I think, probably my favorite out of all of them. Just because, in it, partially because of its um, straightforwardness, and that pretty much everything you see in the trailer you end up doing in the game more or less. But also, just yeah. I, I think it was really nice touch to have the score for the trailer be done f by you, and that really made it embody. You can come back to it, and it, it just feels like home because of that. And it's, I feel like that's a little rare. Like you hey, don't, most of the other cinematic trailers after one and two ended up. And so I feel like it's pretty, it was pretty rare afterwards to have the composer also contribute towards that special kind of E3 trailer. That Yeah. I mean, I do get to do that, you know, um, work on trailers. Like I did the, you know, Robinson, the journey trailer, and I did the music for yeah. the trailer for state of the K2, you know, and the E3 trailer. I mean, I love doing trailer work as well. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, it, it, you know, when you look at that um, E3 trailer for Assassin's Creed 2, it very much feels like it belongs in the Assassin's Creed 2 universe, you know? Yeah. And often trailers feel like they don't belong, at least in an audio sense. Um, yeah. So, you know, you have completely different music in the trailer, 
which is great because maybe they're trying to reach a different demographic. Who knows? But that trailer, yes, it very much feels like it's part of that universe. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, so we'll move on to your final collaboration with the Assassin's Creed team, which was uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations. Now, this uh -huh. one is unique in the fact that it was partially composed by you and then also partially composed by Lauren Balfe, who would go on to score AC3 as well. Um, yeah. And we actually interviewed uh, with Lauren a few oh, years cool. ago, uh, and we chatted a little bit. And when we asked him, he mentioned that, um, you know, one of the big questions is, like, is there any sort of collaboration or anything? And he was like, no, it was pretty much completely separate from Yes, Break Kid. Like, we kind of yeah, just did our own things. And, yeah, and before we get started on some of these fan questions, I was a little curious, like, you know, it, it seems to just become more and more common these days where you see just multiple composers on uh, video game soundtracks. Um, you know, Unity had like three different composers. I know Deus Ex just came out and had like three different composers as well. And it seems like in most cases that it's very similar to, you know, what happened in Revelations where it's just everybody's kind of working separately and then the team just kind of throws all the tracks in the game. And I was wondering if you could shed some light maybe if you have, uh, if you have any sense of this of why there's not more like actual, it, at least it seems to me like there's not any real actual collaboration in a lot of these cases. I mean, that, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's really a question for Ubisoft, you know? I mean, they had decided uh, that this was the way this was going to be worked out. Um, and, you know, I'm not one to challenge that, you know? Okay. I might challenge them on some ideas about the music I'm writing and say, hey, I think we can do something different here. Or, but I'm not going to challenge them in, a, in, a, in their business um, decisions, you know? Right. Okay. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, I mean, both you and Lauren, I think, wrote some really beautiful music for this game. Uh, and so why don't we start off with this question from uh, Matteo Rispoli, who asks, uh, yes, bro, what are some of the original works your compositions have pulled from while working on Assassin's Creed? Songs like Crossroads of the World, which has a beautiful chant in the background. I've always wondered where some of these works came from. Well, I mean, Crossroads of the, of the Crossroads of the World is inspired by you know Assassin's Creed Revelations, the game atmosphere and and the storyline. You know, um, you know, Can Constantinople or Istanbul was at the time very Greek influenced, and so. Um, the exploration music for ACR is, is inspired by Greek instruments and the Greek musical approach mixed with the AC sound I had, I had been working on. Um, and as far as the other part of the question, um, I don't pull music from, from places. Um, I let you know, the game or the project inspire my music. Um, I mean, maybe the, the, the question is, is hinting at, you know, that you you know, you see stuff in, in TV and film where there's a temp score and, you know, you might be asked by the director or producers to, um, you know, match something along the temp score, but that's not the, the world of games, at least not the games I've worked on. Um, I've let the, I very rarely get provided with any temp music and I really let the game inspire the music, you know. And I'm a, I'm a gamer myself, so I can totally get what they're trying to achieve, you know, and I can, mm. I can play the game and I can figure it all out, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't. I can't really speak for Matteo specifically, but I think he might be um, when he talks about original works. He might be talking specifically about things like the chanting in the background of, of Crossroads of the World. Like, is that taken from any traditional, um, you know, historical chants, or is it some? How do, how do you come up with that? Well, when you do these chanting, you have to be careful that um, about how you put this together. You know, in some games, it makes sense to write it in Latin, and then you collaborate with somebody who knows how to, you know, who knows Latin, and then you're, you know, um, you're telling them, this is what I want it to say, and they translate it into Latin. Um, but for this, that mm -hmm. wasn't what we did here. Um, I think with the Assassin's Creed game, we didn't want to be too specific like having a Latin language telling you, oh, I feel good, or oh, beware, or something. We, we wanted it to be much more abstract, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it's okay. more, um, it was more like a made-up language where what was chanted wasn't really a language. It's made to sound like a language. You know, sometimes you have to go in that direction, and I think with this project, it's absolutely important that we don't try to, you know, tell people how to feel. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so you mentioned before, actually, uh, if I could come back to this, um, that the Revelation soundtrack very much takes inspiration from Greek music and culture. Yeah. And I was wondering, uh, for people who are ignorant of me, of what that actually means, like if you could kind of elaborate a little on what's involved with Greek influence on, on the soundtrack, like in what specific way? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's more in, involving in the actual instruments that you choose to work on. Uh, and doing research into Greek music, what kind of ways, you know, um, people like to write music back then. And then you, 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 you look at that and you, you know, try to forget what you just figured out. And then when you sit down and, rec- you know, and compose it, you have these instruments in mind. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, like Greek guitar and these, these different things we recorded. Um, you know, we record a lot of different weird instruments like a lot of the stuff for i mean you know just to give a broader example for example for you know brotherhood and also revelations it was important that these instruments felt like it was instruments that were around at the time that the game was taking place Uh, but you know it was okay if these instruments had been changed you know Mm -hmm. like by some mad inventor or something you know Uh, and so that's a lot of the live instruments we recorded were completely unique. You know, there's only one of these around. And, and um, so that was the rules that I set out. You know, we need to have this foundation of, does this, is this, is, you know, is it possible for this instrument to have been built back then? You know, and then, okay, fine, let's record it. And it might sound completely, you know, nothing like a contrabass or something because it's, it doesn't even, you know, but it has all the acoustic and all the uh, elements of, of those instruments um, that is not made with components, you know, that are modern, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of kind of u- u- unique one-off instruments that we used. Okay, very interesting, cool. Uh, so Revelations, of course, wrapped up the stories of both Altair and Ezio, and you had been along for the entire journey for both of those characters, and so... We have a question here from Katie Robinson, who simply asks, uh, Altair or Ezio? Huh. Um, well, <clears throat> interesting. Altair, I think, this is just my opinion, I think <laughs> he's a little more strict towards his creed, you know? Perhaps a little bit more old-fashioned, you know? Where Ezio's personality, you know, to me, it feels a bit more current and modern you know, in the sense that he's very distracted, you know, he's always distracted, you know, and, and, and the fact that life suddenly turns unbelievably cruel and he has to become a man, you know, an assassin to keep his life together, to, to find a purpose after such a, you know, tragic event, you know, to watch Ezio become a man and later a master assassin, I think is very satisfying. And the fact that you get to play this, you're not just watching it in a cut scene, you actually get to play you know, through his experience is, is amazing. So I would have to say, you know, Ezio, because I feel he's better written. You know, he just has such a great uh, story. See. You know, I like Elsie too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, I asked, um, I interviewed Patrice last year and I asked him the same question and he just, like, his eyes went really wide and he's just like, oh, you can't make me choose between them. They're like my babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, choose between your children. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So, uh, with those four games wrapped up, of course, uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations marks the last time that uh, you were involved with this series. And we have a question from uh, Florenzo Rubino, who asks, um, will you be composing future AC games? And if not, would you still like to? You know, I assume as if you, if the Ubisoft approach you, approached you. Uh, sure, I'm open to the idea. I mean, I very mm-hmm. much enjoyed the collaboration with Ubisoft. And if I was presented with the right opportunity and they were looking for something new, sure, why not? Oh, great. I'm glad to hear that there's no, like, any, not any, like, bad blood or anything either. No, no, no. From the fans' perspective, it's just like, wait, why did they stop with the Esper Kid? As much as, although I, I do really appreciate, you know, now it's kind of just this rotating different composer each game almost. And, you know, I do appreciate uh, what each of them brings to the table. It's always very unique. But, you know, at some point, would that's really great to hear that, you're open to the idea because I think, you know, a lot of the fans and myself included would love to, to hear you tackle another, uh, another game in another time period. Um, mm. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on to another question that's, uh, we had kind of touched on this a little earlier. I just want to verify this with you. Um, but this is from um, Melu Saste, who asks, uh, oh, wow, I can't wait for the podcast. Can you ask him about the upcoming AC movie? Uh, his name is listed on IMDb, so I'm curious about his involvement in the soundtrack. Uh, yeah, I'm not involved with the film score. Okay, I, I kind of assumed that it was just like, oh, they might be using Ezio's family because I still see like in all these newer games, like they still credit you because they use part of the Ezio's family composition, and I'm assuming that this is the same thing, possibly. Yeah, could be. I don't know. Uh, then again, IMDb can also be completely wrong sometimes, so I think it's totally possible. <laughs> Okay, now we have, uh, moving on to kind of like miscellaneous questions and about the composing process. Uh, we have a question from Malashka who asks, uh, how important do you think the role of the soundtrack is in setting the atmosphere slash mood for the game? Do you think the composer has a larger, equal, or less responsibility for how the setting is perceived by the player compared to, for example, the graphics team? I think the role of the composer is as important as the game team want it to be you know um mm. if you know if the team is looking for a bit of combat music here and there to get the combat music feeling more intense uh, not no to get the combat um uh gameplay feeling more intense then that's all that's all you're gonna you're gonna get in in the game uh, you know some some intense uh you know the mood enhanced when you're doing the combat but if you look at it more broadly um you know then you can enhance the entire game, you know, and you can enhance the atmosphere. You can enhance the depth of the gameplay experience, ex especially if you play to things that are not necessarily happening on screen, but that keeps reminding you about the story. Um, like, for example, with Edge's family playing in the opening of AC2, it reminds you of something else than what you're actually seeing, which is two people sitting on a rooftop, you know? Um, yeah. So I think that's where you can really enhance it but it has to be something that the um the game team would want enhanced you know yeah and so i mean if if i'm tell, told to to enhance the whole game uh, i'm feeling then that i'm being brought on board more as a collaborator as someone who is who is part of the team who who can help bring their vision to fruition um, and, you know, expand it and even enhance what they thought we could do. Um, and, 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 you know, this way a score can become, you know, really unique and, and it, it will help with the game and atmosphere. And um, so, you know, for, for, the, for the composer to really feel part of the team, uh, that will definitely, you know, you're, you're able to really enhance the atmosphere of the game if, if you work it this way, you know. Yeah, I think that's very well said. Uh, we have a question from Nexa about the writing process as well, who asks, um, do you ever experience writer's block when composing your material? And if so, how do you deal with it? Uh, I do not, because I write music every day, and I have <laughs> been writing music every day since I was 13. You know, I wrote music before <laughs> that, too. But at that time, I started writing every day, you know. Of course, some days I don't, but for the most part, it's every day. So what I do is when, if I, of course once in a while I write some music and it doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't resonate with the scene or it's not appropriate. Then I just put that aside and I start over, you know, I don't even sweat it. It's just right away. I start over. And I think that's, that's how I deal with it. I, I don't, you know, I don't suggest people, um, sit around, think too much about it. Just, you know, if you don't like it, you don't like it, you know, start over. <laughs> Don't, don't think about too much there. Don't think about what's wrong with it. Why don't I lie? Just, you know, if you have a little bit of a idea about, about that, okay, great. Now start over. Off you go. You know? Yeah. What, what does that process uh, look like for you every day? It's like to me, who, who has no compositional skills like whatsoever, it's kind of foreign to me, this idea of like you sit down at your keyboard, like, like you know, you wake up, sit down at the keyboard, and then do you just start kind of, playing around excuse my ignorance but i just don't know i yeah, don't yeah, understand how things kind of <laughs> how these well, songs kind of take shape in the beginning you know i mean music just happened to me you know i didn't i i don't have an education i'm mostly self-taught you know okay. um and once i realized that i was very interested in music you know i took some some classes after school and like piano composition and stuff like that you know 
and I sang like a choir and as a kid, like tons of people, you know, there's just stuff that I was doing that, um, but I was always, always listening to music. That was one of my, I just love listening to music, you know, and I think that's where it really starts. Um, you have to love writing music. You really do because um, mm. the hours are crazy. You know, if you sit there at four in the morning with a deadline and people are asking you, why, why are you doing this? This is crazy. <laughs> Go to bed, you know, but I mean, this is what it entails and you just have to really love it. And, and that's, you know, I couldn't not write a track every day when I was a kid. Once I got my first computer and started writing, that was just, they were, that was just the way of things. You know, I had to do that. Um, okay. So, yeah, it feels very natural to me. I don't really think too much about it, you know. And and I can't I can't explain to you how, how it feels. I can just tell you that I, I I've always been writing music as long as I can remember. And so and it was always my own music. It was never like I was really I had no interest in trying to practice other people's music. That's just not really what I'm about, you know. Interesting. Well, on the slight subject of uh, your music and other people's music, we had a question from Snafu, which was really highly voted in the questions, which is, what is your personal favorite AC soundtrack that you did not compose? And what is your favorite that you did compose? Okay, so my favorite score that I did compose would be AC2. You know, it was the most fun to work on. And everyone on the team was so excited about this game. Um, uh, I don't know if there's been a game that has been this romantic since AC2. It feels like a really unique game and I'm I'm proud of my music and I'm proud that it helped set the tone for this great game. Yeah. Um as far as like the my favorite AC soundtrack from other composers, I haven't actually listened to those soundtracks. Uh, I'm aware of the other composers, but I, I haven't listened to the soundtracks. Okay. No problem. All right. Uh and then to get a little more specific and uh with coming up from the last question, um Poison HW asks uh, you've composed so many tracks for Assassin's Creed. Do you have a favorite? Yeah, that's a lot of music. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Home in Florence is, is probably one of my favorites. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting track because you, you, you know, the very strange uh, the, um, writing technique I, I utilized in that track. And also it mixes the, uh, the synthesizers and the electronics with the uh, more acoustic live performances so it's a really good track to to blend things together so this this track feels like it belongs in the animus And I also really like Dream of, uh, Dreams of Venice. Um, but probably my favorite is actually Sanctuary, you know. Um, oh, okay. I just really, really like that track. Uh, it was written for um, a cemetery, um, you know, place. And so it was all about um, capturing a sense of peace and a sense of, um, you know, not, not death, but more like the afterlife, you know, um, mm. which... It's, by the way, something I got to explore a lot more in Dark Siders too, but it was definitely something that when I wrote this track, I thought, oh, there's something here. There's a lot more here to say <laughs> than this one track, <laughs> you know? So uh, I got to go there a couple of years later. Um, and, you know, uh, also um, really like The Plague. Um, I think it has this weird otherworldly feeling, and I was uh, really, you know, proud of that. That was a tricky one to compose, too.
So I, I I noticed that all of these tracks are from AC2, and these are one these are your favorite across all four albums. They all just happen to be like you you just really were into AC2 that much, I guess. Is that well, right? you know, it, it was just such a like, like I mentioned, there was such excitement around this game when we were working on it, and that was just so apparent. And not only that, after um, playing Earth to the team, oh man, they just got it. They were totally mm. on board with this track and it, it surprised me and I felt like after that um, it you know they gave me the creative freedom to really go and and, and do something um, they, they could see I was tapped into the animus you know and, and that's how I felt during that process um, and so I continued that also um, with the with the next scores but I think on Assassin's Creed 2 that's where it happened that's where that shift happened you know where yeah. Assassin's Creed 1, we were focused a lot more on gameplay elements. You know, on Assassin's Creed 2 and beyond, there was a lot more about, oh, the exploration music. That's where the game really lives, you know? I mean, that's, of course, it lives on all the missions too, but, the, you know, people love exploring in these games. We need to yeah. make sure that we have that covered too, you know? And so when you get that, you know, freedom to write these three, four, five-minute long tracks, you've got a lot more to work with as far as setting the mood instead of saying, yeah, we have a, you know, one minute combat situation over here that we need to transition for when it's done. That's fine. You know, but for the exploration music, you get to go a little bit deeper. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, we have another question here from Luca216, a little similar, but might have a different answer. Us, they ask a simple question. Uh, which song is the most personal for you? Hmm, that's probably Sanctuary. Again, you know, it was okay. written to get that whole afterlife feel, resting souls, and and um, I felt like I dug pretty deep for that one. You know, it was um, it was it was more of a performance piece than uh, you know it was just like something I sat down and played. You know. Does that come from anywhere specific, uh, like your interest in the the afterlife and? for sanctuary and everything uh, well i just you know i i you know not to get into religion but i feel i'm a i'm a, I'm a spiritual person you know uh, mm-hmm. i definitely believe there's more uh you know i don't think 3d is the ultimate dimension <laughs> no, i think <laughs> i think it goes beyond 3d you know um so yeah that that's that's something i can i can tap into i feel um I think there's more in this universe than we we figured out, and it's it's again something that I just love putting in my music. Um, you know, a, a sense of like mystery or even mysticism and these different things. You know, the kind of music that I really like to listen to is music where when you hear it, you're like, how the hell did he think of that? You know, where <laughs> was he when he wrote this? What was the mindset? You know, yeah. and I think I take some of that with me, you know, music you like is often what you try to put into your own music. You know, I, I played Darksiders 1, I haven't quite gotten to 2 yet, but I listened to the soundtrack off and on again, and it really is, it really captures a lot of that, I think, that very otherworldly feel and a little bit of the, how did this come about? It's so beautiful and weird, and <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's well, so it, it is weird, isn't it? Because when you talk to somebody, oh yeah, this game is about death. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And it's like, wow, Literally okay, death. you play death. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. And then you hear the music and you're like, wait a minute. There's something going on here. You know, what, yeah. there's something more going on here than just death. But that, that <laughs> you know, not to get into dark side us, but that, the, yep. the team, they just completely um, told me we want something different. We want something original or more, you know, unique. Uh, so I was just, um, you know, we talked a lot about all that, but um, yeah. they, they definitely wanted me to do something that was different from what you would expect for a score like this. Excellent. Okay, so we have a question from Simon Vetter who asks, uh, can you name uh, any classical soundtrack or game composers or bands uh, that were a big influence on the AC scores? Well, the funny thing is when, you, when you're writing, for me anyway, I try not to listen to too much music because I don't want it creeping into my music. Sometimes, yeah. you know, it can happen and you're not even aware of it, you know? And so I actually don't listen to a lot of music. I do more like the research, and then I try to forget what I listen to um, and, then, and then start from that. Um, but I did listen to, to, to some classical music, um, for sure, you know. And um, Slavinsky is one of my favorites. And that, that would be some of the classical music I would be listening to around that time. Okay, great. Uh, so we have a question from Arshward who asks, uh, in your mind, which Assassin's Creed was the most challenging to figure out the soundtrack to, or, and or like which one took the most time to compose and why? You know, I think Assassin's Creed 1 was probably the, 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 the biggest challenge to write. Um, mm. it, it, it was, not only was it a massive amount of music um, over three hours, it was also, you know, the game, the, the team was figuring out the game as I was writing the music, like, of course, the game was far along and it, it, things were working out great, but they were still tweaking and figuring out things. So it wasn't as, um, you know, there was a lot of experimentation going on, you know? Um, yeah. So that, that makes it always a challenge. You have to kind of follow all that, you know? But, um, you know, and the, the Assassin's Creed 1 score, it was, it was a much more primal score, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Full of like, I don't know, it's like evil folk music in there, you know, and <laughs> um, you know, and at the same time, we had all this very primal dark stuff, and it yet it had to sound like it was going through the animus, which is this filter that you know electronically manipulates and infuses the score. And I mean, that's something that I got going in all this, you know, Assassin's Creed scores I wrote. But that started here, you know. So I had to figure that out, too, for this one, you know. So there was a lot to figure out here. Um, so that, that made, it really, made it really tricky to, to figure it all out. But, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience. So. And Assassin's Creed, too, there was much more focus on the story and the atmosphere, you know, it was just a super atmospheric game. Um, and again, I, I said this already, I felt like I was set loose to come up with something that was, wasn't being restricted by gameplay or anything, you know. Um, yeah. And so it also had to do with the, the gameplay was involving, so I got to score more exploration music. You know, it, it's not that it was easier, it's just that it was a bit clearer what was needed. And on Assassin's Creed 1... It was a, a bit more of a, it was a bit more of a fog there. You know, we had to really work ourselves through it. Yeah, especially so. since the game, as we mentioned earlier, was so new and different and kind of uncharted territory. There were so many new gameplay elements in there that that I hadn't seen before. You know, like the investigation music and the following and the you know sitting on a bench eavesdropping music, where you had to make yeah. sure that you could hear what they were saying, but at the same time, you should be able to hear the music and. There, there was a lot of different challenges in that, yeah. And how yeah. all the different tracks blended together and transitioned together. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. So speaking of AC1, I know you said earlier that AC1 probably had the most music written for it out of all the games. Mm. And yeah. we had a question here from uh, Sven Wensink who asks, is there any chance we'll ever see a similar extended release for AC, AC2, and ACB, meaning extended releases that contain and combine all of the previously released material and maybe some new unreleased content? And so before we get into this, I just want to note that the um, Best of Jesper Kid album that just came out does have, I believe, eight 
either extended or previously unreleased tracks. Yeah, there's seven seven unreleased tracks, and then there's one extended okay. track. Great. Yes, um, but at the same time, you know, you mentioned AC One has probably the most music written for it, but yeah. the only thing that's available is this. Uh, I think it's only like ten or twelve tracks, maybe, for yeah. the soundtrack. And so, yeah. any chance that uh, we'll see any sort of release for AC One, Two, and Brotherhood for even more? I think we're, the fans are just ravenous for more, you know, <laughs> music from these time periods. So. I mean, I mean that would be up to Ubisoft, you know. But but for sure, there's a lot of materials that could be collected from from these scores, you know. Okay. Um, I mean, I would love to see a full, you know, vinyl box release of the of the of the best of, you know, Yes, the Kids CD, uh, an album and, and, and vinyl um, picture yeah. disc. But you know, it's really not up to me, you know. But if anybody um, was to ask me, I'd love to put it together. <laughs> we'll start our petitioning then right okay uh just a couple more quick questions um katie robinson asks and we touched on this a little bit but um when you're making the scores for assassin's creed how did you balance the historical and sci-fi elements well you know again that was um balanced um with the animus in mind you know um i don't you know, it's a, it's a good point about the balance because it definitely is a balance. But I think I touched on, on all this already, but, but it's, it's, it's like this filter that gets put on top of the music. That was mm-hmm. the approach that we were going for and to make sure that, you know, everything you hear in the game, it's just a little bit off. And you, 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 can, do, you can still do, you know, a beautiful track that sounds like it belongs in Italy but you certainly can do some manipulations on it too. That doesn't mean it's not beautiful or whatever, you know, you, you can yeah. still get there. Um, and that's very much what we worked on with, with all of my Assassin's Creed music. It, it all has those kind of influences in there. Yep, absolutely. Okay, one final question here from Untitled0110 who asks, if you could redo any song from any soundtrack that you were involved in creating, would you? And if so, which one would you change? Oh, that's a that's a strange question. Um, <laughs> what would I? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, or you could also maybe think of remix, maybe as well, like you did the yeah. Venice Rooftops remix. Yeah, I mean, Assassin's Creed Revelations. I, I, you know, I guess I, you know, I would have liked to have had a little bit more resources available for for you know for some more live elements. So I guess I could go go back and add some more you know soloists to to some of those tracks. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay, well, I think with that, we'll wrap up the community questions. And, you know, since Assassin's Creed Revelations came out, you've been fairly busy with several games that people can check out. Um, you did the score for Darksiders 2, like we mentioned, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, you've been doing Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel, I believe, as well as State of Decay. And Robinson, The Journey, just came out. This is a PSVR exclusive game, I believe... Uh, what, what's the big claim to fame for that one? I think it's that it's Epic's first uh, VR game. Is that correct? Oh, no, it's Crytek. I am so sorry. It's Crytek. Yeah, it was Crytek. And, you know, I, I've, I've been a big admirer of Crytek for years, you know. Um, love their games. One of my all-time favorite games is, is Far Cry on the PC. That was, mm-hmm. to me, one of the most amazing games I've ever played. And uh, ever since then, I've always wanted to work with, with Crytek. So this was really an, a, a great honor to to be able to work with them on their latest project. Yeah, I have a PSVR. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but I'm curious if you found there was anything different about composing for a VR game as opposed to a regular uh, standard game. Well, this is my only uh, VR game so far, so I don't Mm -hmm. know if it's fair to say that what I've discovered here is something that generally works on all VR games. But for Robinson the Journey, I can say that we were looking for something that was a bit more subtle, um, and you know, it was kind of a new thing for me to to create something a bit more subtle. Um, so that that was that was the style we went for here. You know, again, you know, it was well, not again, but yeah, it was a mixture of like sci-fi and um, you know, cinematic music and different experiences. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, do you have, I mean, I know you put out so many soundtracks per year. It's kind of crazy to me that you're so prolific, but um, is would you like to tell us about any projects that you're allowed to speak about right now that are coming out soon? 
Um, I'm working on two games right now, but they haven't been announced, so I'm not allowed to talk about them just yet. Um, so, you know, that's kind of been my, my year, just working away, but I uh, can't talk about these just yet. Okay. Uh, what about State of Decay 2? Is it my imagination that you were working on that, or is no comments on <laughs> on that? <laughs> or... like, there's like silence at the other end right now. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> But, you know, I'm not, uh, I can't really say anything, you know? Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Well, we will definitely look forward to um, <laughs> your future projects once you're able to speak about them. And, of course, uh, you know, we can keep up with what you're working on via your social media if you want to give, if you want to plug your social media accounts for everyone listening to keep up. Yeah, sure. I mean, go to my website, justbekit.com. Um, you can you can have access. I also been um, you know got my YouTube page going. Um, so you know I'm on you know Twitter, Facebook, and all that. So you can find all those links on my website. Yeah, great. And you know, just from me and I know a lot of fans that share the same sentiment. Thank you so much for uh, your time with the series and all the beautiful, beautiful music that you compose for it. And just like from my personal perspective, like these soundtracks. When I listen to them, I get so ridiculously emotional in a way that pretty much no other soundtracks really touch me. And it's just really, really something special. And I think, you know, even even though Ubisoft is using different composers now, you know, they still... I noticed... I think it's very telling that when they released their launch trailer or their reveal trailer for the Eagle Flight VR game, um, you know, they, inc- they scored it to one of your uh, just... I don't think it's associated with any game, but it's uh, Aphelion, I believe. Yeah, actually, that is interesting. That was um, that was one of my tracks. Yeah, I mean, this track is a it's a track that I did uh, uh, for like a trailer album or something like that, and it's um, yeah. So it's it's interesting that they chose that track for the for the trailer. Yeah, and I'm watching. You know, it's like an eagle, and it's flying around this old European city, and. Like you know, with the with this like, Where's the assassin hiding? soundtrack. <laughs> I know, and I'm like, I see what you're, I see what you're doing here, Ubisoft. You're pulling at my heartstrings, and it's working. <laughs> <laughs> I have to try that game out now. But yeah, yeah I, I think you've definitely left your mark on the series, and just really appreciate everything you did for it. Cool, man. My pleasure. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, so now we're just gonna quickly before we go, uh, like as I promised earlier, we're going to be giving away. A signed version, uh, a signed copy of the Best of Yes for Kid uh, picture disc, the picture LP, uh, which is just super generous. We're really grateful to you and um, Greg at Top Dollar PR for uh, making this happen. So, if you're interested in uh, when in entering the giveaway for this, please leave a comment on this YouTube video about what your favorite Esper Kid track is for the Assassin's Creed series, and of course any other comments you have about the episode. And then also mention that you uh, want to be entered for this uh, LP giveaway. And yeah, and we'll uh, one way or another get it to you. Let's say, um, you know, maybe one week from when this podcast is released on my YouTube channel, we will cut off uh, entries and then we'll randomly draw one and ship it out to you. And it would be a really, really cool item for someone out there, Lucky Assassin's Creed fan. <laughs> all right, so with that said, um, thank you again, Jesper, for spending so much time talking about all these wonderful tracks. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. If you want to keep up with more episodes of the Assassin's Den podcast and other videos and podcasts and interviews that I do, uh, of course, subscribe to this channel at youtube.com slash loomer. Um, you can also keep up with me on Twitter and Facebook. At Twitter, I am loomer979, and the same goes for Facebook. So with that said, thank you very much for listening, and until next time, we'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye.